It should be uh, fairly easy to uh, cover 20 years of work in uh, uh, 30 minutes. That's not what I'm going to try to do. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, first uh, Sam Schulman and Jeff Weitz for the invitation to give this talk. Streptokinase is an important bacterial pathogen, and uh, may my talk uh, focuses on the roles of the invisible parts of the activation mechanism. And that will become clear, I hope, as I move forward through the talk. Just a, a local interest. Uh, this is a painting by Toronto artist uh, William Ron Ronald entitled Heart Attack. Seemed appropriate for this session. He had a heart attack while painting this in 1998. And I don't know if he had any thrombolytic therapy. Ah, this is the structure, one of two structures of uh, plasminogen, the full-length protein glue plasminogen, uh, which is, of course, the zymogen form of uh, plasmin. And uh, this is a crystal structure of the compact co conformation solved by two groups, uh, Dr. Wistock's group, in uh, Australia and Olson's group in Aster at AstraZeneca in Switzerland. Uh, so plasmid engine consists of an amino terminal pan uh, module, which is different names for different people, but it stands for PG apple nematode, and it's a, a unique fold for, uh, for this pan module. Uh, five Kringle domain, domains and a serine proteinase catalytic domain. Uh, this the, the, this uh, compact conformation is stabilized by lysine binding site interactions of Kringles 2, 4, and 5. They're indicated there. And uh, chloride ions, which are actually very important. Plasminogen can also exist in other conformations including a partially uh, or fully extended conformation called uh, uh, beta or gamma, not surprisingly. And uh, the binding of small molecules such as benzamidine and uh, epsilon amino caproic acid, which is an outdated name. It's easier to say than 6-aminohexanoic acid, I guess. <clears throat> the extended forms of these uh, of this zymogen uh, are activated much faster by TPA, UPA, and streptokinase. The proteases and SK activate PG by different mechanisms. And before talking about SK, I want to refresh your memory of the classical mechanism of proteolytic zymogen activation. So here it is. Most hemostatic proteases uh, belong to the comatrypsinogen family. They're activated by a single peptide bond cleavage. The mechanism of zymogen activation is shown here for prethrombin 2, which is uh, an inexplicable name for the catalytic domain of prothrombin. Cleavage of the arch 15 isoleucine 16 peptide bond generates a new amino terminus, uh, isoleucine 16, that's what you're watching on the right over there, which uh, generates a new amino terminus that inserts uh, into the amino terminal binding cleft in the catalytic domain, forming a salt bridge with ASP194. This induces a conformational change in the catalytic domain, which you can see by the move, moving segments there, and that generates the S1 specificity site and the oxyanion hole, which are required for substrate binding and catalysis. So if we zoom in on this, you can see that the activation pocket is got a uh, the ASP194 in it, and uh, the should be uh, is isoleucine 16. 
So that's the way it works for 99% of the serine proteinase cymogens. And of course, there's a exception to that, and it's this one. And in 1976, Robert Huber and Wolfram Boda postulated that SK may activate PG by inserting its own amino terminus into the amino terminal binding cleft of plasminogen. This was the origin of the molecular sexuality hypothesis, and there's no crystallographic proof for SK activation, activating plasminogen, but there is uh, for prethrombin 2 and a staphylocoagulase fragment. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, solution studies are uh, uh, by um, Liz Hedstrom and uh, Guy Reed showed clearly that uh, there's ample proof for the molecular sexuality mechanism in both cases. It's just a, a crystallographic in this. So uh, we uh, collaborated with Wolfram Boda's lab in solving the structure of this SC1-325 fragment bound to prethrombin 2. The SC is shown in gold, and uh, my colleague over there is showing you, zooming in on the uh, binding pocket. And there it is, up close. The first six residues are labeled for the end terminus of SC1-325. Well, we did some um, uh, primitive uh, end terminal mutant characterization uh, to see what we could get into this activation pocket. And uh, so these are chromogenic substrate. Uh, titrations, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, prothrombin uh, being activated by these uh, staphylocoagulase fragments. So uh, the SC1-325 uh, is obviously the most active. If we took off the isoleucine uh, N-terminal amino acid, it only lost about sixfold in uh, affinity for prothrombin, apparent uh, affinity from the uh, rates. Uh, if we added a methionine residue preceding the isoleucine and terminus, it lost 60 fold in affinity, uh, but it's still a fully activated uh, prothrombin. And if we took the first two amino acids and cut them off, it was essentially completely inactive, demonstrating a critical role for the dive peptide. Okay, now to streptokinase. Uh, despite its name, it's uh, not a kinase or an enzyme, which is, we say this around the lab all the time. It's uh, Streptokinase activates uh, human fibrinolysis by, in fact, the molecular sexuality mechanism coupled to proteolytic generation of pr plasmin from plasminogen. SK is also a pathogenicity factor in group A streptococcal infections and a few of the severe uh, types of uh, Infections are listed here. I haven't added a long list. The advent of multidrug resistant bacterial pathogens and the lack of new antibiotics have made infectious diseases a major public health problem, which uh, should not, um, should be recognized by people who issue uh, research grants, but apparently that's not the case. SK uh, secreted by group A streptococci is classified into three clusters, which will be important at the very end. 
Uh, they're called SK1, SK2A, and SK2B. And these are sequence, uh, they vary in sequence. There are allelic variants, and they vary in virulence, uh, and it's mechanism-based. The only crystal structure for streptokinase bound to the catalytic domain of uh, plasmin. This was done by Kai Zhang at uh, the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, which is the only structure available. SK obviously has three domains, uh, folded, tightly folded domains, alpha, beta, and gamma from the end of the C terminus, and they're linked by flexible seg segments. This means that in solution, streptokinase has no structure. Its domains uh, are behaved like three balls on a string. And that's probably the reason why it's never been crystallized uh, alone, uh, because it exists in so many different forms. So when SK binds to plasmin, however, uh, be it microplasmin or, or plasminogen, it forms a three-sided crater surrounding the catalytic site, as shown here in the top and side views. It's a, sort of a, you know, unusual structure where the um, catalytic domain of plasminogen is uh, at the bottom, at the base of the crater. And, it sh and what this forms is a surface for binding of another PG molecule as a substrate. So plasmin by itself uh, will not activate plasminogen, surprisingly. Uh, you can let it incubate forever and then nothing happens. Well, everything gets degraded, but nothing, <laughs> nothing gets activated. But the plasmin alone doesn't work, but bound to SK, the SK plasmin uh, complex is a specific uh, proteolytic activator of plasminogen. Uh, what is not seen here in any of these structures is the N-terminal 1 to 11 sequence. The C-terminal 42 residue segment and the 250 loop, which would, should be sort of on the left side of the beta domain. And those are just invisible because they cannot be uh, seen. They're too mobile. So our toolbox for studying the mechanism uh, of plasma chain activation by um, SK uh, includes uh, binding equilibrium binding in kinetic studies, which is no surprise to most of you. Uh, we prepared active site labeled uh, plasminogen analogs to measure SK binding. So, of course, when SK binds to PG, it uh, induces formation of an active catalytic site, but this is a transient species. And so it's hard to trap, but it, but it can, it's hard work, but it's, hard, it's possible to trap this transiently formed, uh, conformationally activated uh, plasminogen molecule with a thioester tripeptide chloromethyl ketone and uh, incorporate that inhibitor into the active site and uh, subsequently label it with a fluorescence probe and uh, purify it away from the streptokinase, and you have a, uh, a, fin a labeled uh, plasminogen analog. So the graph at the bottom is uh, compares glue plasminogens, uh, the two um, glycoforms. That's why there are all the data points on there. The open, the open symbols are the two glycoforms. For glue plasminogen, which you see has the short, uh, highest dis dissociation constant, therefore the lowest affinity uh, compared to these other things, which are lice PG uh, analogs, uh, 
same thing's true of the symbols, open symbols of the two glycoforms. And way, way downfield there is uh, uh, SK plasmin. So streptokinase binds plasmin with a really profound uh, high affinity. Uh, the KDE is a 12 picomolar. So um, we didn't find a, any difference between the glycoforms for those, that comparison. Our second approach is steady state kinetics of plasminogen activation by streptokinase. And I, whenever I say steady state kinetics, I can hear the minds closing in the audience. Uh, it's a palpable thing. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, nobody likes this stuff. Uh, you think we like it? Uh, we, we, it's not, not really our favorite thing either. So I'll go be as gentle with you as I can. The panel A shows what the data looks like for hydrolysis of a chromogenic substrate. Uh, these are just progress curves, and as you can see, they're not straight. They're curved, and the reason why they're curved is because they follow this parabolic equation on the right. So we fit that equation to those data, and we get two numbers out, the V1 and V2, two different kinds of velocities. Okay, and in panel B, you can see that V1 shows an SK dependence very different from V2. And that's because they measure different things. And we can extract uh, all the kinetic parameters we need by analysis of the stuff in panel B. So a lot of kinetics experiments later, we uh, came up with a, what we call a unified mechanism of plasminogen activation. And it goes like this. Starting in the upper left, where it says PG and SK, the SK binds to free plasminogen and conformationally activates it in the SK-PG star complex. Oh, I forgot to say there's two catalytic cycles in our mechanism. A trigger, trigger cycle, which I'm just starting on, and a second cycle called the bullet cycle. So, um, so we, that happens. And then that third molecule of plasminogen binds to the SKPG complex, forming a ternary complex, which is cleaved proteolytically to form a SK plasmin complex, okay? The plasmin dissociates, and like I said, you saw the data, the plasmin binds really tightly to SK, about 800 to 1,000 fold more tightly. So it starts sopping up a plasmin, that is, starts sopping up the SK immediately when it's formed. And that forms, that forms an SK Plasmin complex, which is also a catalytic complex, it binds another molecule of plasminogen as a substrate and converts all the rest of that free plasminogen into plasma. So the neat thing about this is that it only, the trigger only needs to turn a couple of times to generate enough plasmin to shut down because it doesn't have any streptokinase left and uh, the entire thing goes by the bullet cycle below. And what the parts you don't see in this uh, case are the N terminus, the C terminus, and again the 250 loop. So I won't uh, dwell on this anymore. Okay, we looked at the N-terminus in more detail in streptokinase. It's a simple experiment, but it's hard to understand. So we, we took the isoleucine uh, off the N-terminus of SK, 
And yeah, lo and behold, it, it would not activate plasminogen conformationally at all. Okay, no big surprise. But then we, we threw in an, a peptide that corresponds to SK1 to 10. And if you add that peptide to it, it rescues the, the other form, the dead form of streptokinase. And why it does that, we're not too sure. But that allowed us to uh, do another kind of thing, which was alanine scanning of all the residues in the uh, 10, uh, 10 residues of the SKN terminus. And when we did that, we got, uh, they didn't all do the same thing or different things. So a lot of them were uh, concluded uh, totally important, like the isoleucine, Surprisingly, the glycine in position three, the proline position four, the and this <laughs> aspartic acid way at position nine, which was twofold more effective than uh, wild type. I mean, this is really amazing, uh, and this uh, suggests that uh, the extended end terminus plays a role in conformational plasminogen activation. SK isn't the only virulence factor in, in the soup. There's another one called PAM that stands for plasminogen binding group A streptococcal M-like protein. You can see why they abbreviated it PAM. And PAM is a helical, like most M proteins, an alpha helical, helical coil which is covalently linked to the cell wall of staphylococci, and it's an imperfect alpha helical coiled coil. And at the, it's linked to the cell wall as shown in the cartoon. And at the other end is our uh, binding sites for plasminogen and plasmin. And these are really tight by binding sites. So the, this, the bacteria would become covered with this, this uh, plasminogen, which can be activated by, guess, guess who, streptokinase. And so you end up with plasmin coating back, coated bacteria that is bound there really tightly to these the most distant part, and this allows the, the PAM to run through a fibrin barrier uh, put up by uh, the initial host re response to infection and just run through soft tissue like crazy as it does in the disease uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Okay, I'll, I'll conclude with some in vivo studies by one of our colleagues, Peter Panese, who's at Auburn University. So he did this flow cytometry experiment where we put uh, rhodamine labeled, active site labeled plasmin and uh, ALAB49, which is a type 2B SK from uh, strep pyogenes. And that means that it's not, it's kind of dead. It's not too active. Anyway, so he showed that if he, so the, the label, fluorescently labeled PM bound to the cell wall on, of uh, these bacteria by flow cytometry, and that if he added a, this thing called soluble PAM, which no longer has the cell wall linker to it, he could uh, shift this to the left, which means that it uh, displaced the uh, labeled PAM from the bacteria. So, turns out that mice are quite resistant to bacterial infection, 
because their plasminogen is not activated by streptokinase at all. And in fact, their, their PAM is is not, the, the PAM is the same, but their um, plasminogen doesn't bind PAM very well. So what people do to have a mouse model is add human plasminogen. So we uh, went kind of, kind of mad crazy and gave the mice tal vein injections up to, leading, leading to a plasma level of uh, just short of two micromolar which is what the human level is. And in that, my, in those condition mice, addition of this uh, reluctant ALAB uh, as pyogenes caused massive inflammation and uh, fatality. So if you try hard enough, you can show that human plasminogen uh, can be injected into mice at a very high level. Okay, some future prospects. It's my last slide. Uh, we're interested in novel uh, small animal imaging with uh, bioluminescent bacteria, uh, in part uh, because we want to do this uh, cool imaging thing called multispectral optoacoustic tomography or MSOT, which allows deep tissue penetration, I mean a centimeter or so, which is about, you know, halfway through a mouse. And so we're planning to do that. Uh, streptokinase from group A streptococci has no known inhibitors. So we want to be, we want to make mechanism-based inhibitors that are based on mouse monoclonal antibodies targeting critical regions of SK and PM. A tight binding um, such, such a monoclonal antibody against staphylocoagulase one to ten, uh, we is in Bill Church, Bill Church made at uh, Green Mountain Antibodies, uh, who we collaborate with, and it has been shown to increase survival on in a mouse model of Staph aureus sepsis. So this is a an antibody that grabs the amino terminus of staphylococcus and prevents molecular sexuality. I don't know how, how you want to name such a thing, but that's the kind of an inhibitor it is. And these uh, antibodies that we want to make we can be engineered, if you don't know this, to be humanized, that is all human sequence, and uh, they can be engineered to exhibit a great infinity beyond what they did before. So that's our plan. So I uh, will thank them. Uh, past and present uh, members of in my lab, Peter at Auburn, uh, Bill Church at, at uh, Green Mountain Antibodies, the Max Planck Institute people, and a little bit of NIH funding. Thank you for your attention.